The true impact of Christ in a person's life is intended not just for a moment, but for a lifetime. The impact is called the awakened life. Stay tuned to this message to discover how to live the awakened life. Now, I want to make this statement before I get in the message now. There's some things of your faith that are real easy. Is that true? Just something, I mean, receiving the blessings of God, getting up in the morning, breathing the fresh air, knowing that God's going to supply all of your needs. I mean, they're just, Wesley, they're just blessings. There's just some things in their faith that just are so easy to do. But last week we discovered with David that there's some growth marks that are not so easy. I'd ask you to do this if you, if you, have, if you have a note. If some of you don't take notes, that's okay as well. You do. And uh, Brother Danny always says this, on why y'all take notes and never look at them again. And so I always look at mine again. And so I'd ask that you do something today on a piece of paper, or, or on your, your phone or whatever. I, would you write this down? I'm currently having a hard time with and put a blank there for whatever yours is. Just fill in the blank. I'm currently having a hard time with. And kind of just leave it somewhere then. Because it's kind of there resonating. Let it, let it cook on the stove a little bit of your mind and heart. I'm currently having a hard time with. You see, the truth is that all of us have those moments and things that are hard in our lives. And for example, when you, when you read Matthew 5, 43 and 44, Jesus said this, you have heard that you should, should, should uh, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say this, that you should love your enemies and pray for those who spitefully use you. Some would say that's the gold standard, but I'd say that's the God standard. See, Jesus lived that out. Remember on the cross, we'll celebrate it Friday night at 630 together. Jesus said, Luke 22 and 34, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. How many of you would be honest and say that forgiveness may be the hardest thing that you ever deal with? A few of us in the room, rest of you, so have already conquered it and praise God that you have, or either you're a good liar and and I can't tell that you're lying. And I hope that you have conquered it, but I find in my life that most people really, truly, 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 truly struggle with their enemies. And we've come to the place in David's life that David, remember last week we saw him in the ordinary circumstance of life, that he was intimate with God. He was interceding for other people in his own life in that cave with 600 of his favorite friends. He was training them in the Lord, and he was intentional in his relationship with the Lord. Listen to what David said. Write, write this down, Psalm 18 and 3. David said this, I call upon the Lord who's worthy to be praised. Now listen to this, I'm saved from my enemies. Here's what I find in my life is this, that one of the hardest things, and maybe online, if you're honest, no one's around, you could just write that down or say amen yourself. The the truth is that forgiveness is a tough issue. And what I want to do today is to help you to walk through in your life to this particular place because this, I find this great thing about our faith that you can, as David did, write this down. David was, it's, it's coming on the screen for you. David was growing in the presence of his enemies. See, God does not just give you people that are roses. He gives you, can I get an amen, people who are thorns. <laughs> I, I don't want to be a thorn to you, but I'm sure that somebody, I'm a thorn in their side. They're just, if they're a lost person, I know until they come to Christ, you're a thorn in their side. It's light looking into the darkness. I'm sure that, that maybe there's sin maybe in some of our lives at times that cause us to have a thorn moment. Or maybe your hard moment is something that they're just picking at you right now. Here's what I want you to know this, that God intends for you to forgive. It is the God standard. But it doesn't only want you to forgive. He wants, wants you also to be free from what's been hurting you. And here's what I find is just that we say, God, I, I need to forgive. I'm really trying to do this, and, but, but I, I, I want to be free from it. But here's what usually happens, and I, and I wrote this down as I was reviewing. We often move forward to a moment, then we trip over the memory, or we get caught back. Am I telling the truth? Or we get caught back up in a moment where the, the person hurt us is doing it again. Or we find ourselves, maybe it's in our own lives that, that maybe we're the one that, that we're actually, we're the thorn in our own side. I can say that in my own life sometimes. I keep my foot in my mouth. Anybody else like that as well? I can be in the flesh sometimes. And so today, what we're going to do is find that, da- that David, remember for 10 years, Saul is after him and he's constantly after him. We come to a moment that David is just going to blow us away. And there, there, there's no new material other than the narrative of the story. There's no commands. There's no imperatives in the text. But we'll have to look to Jesus because David, just like us, is not perfect. But in this moment of his life, David is going to show us a wow moment of how that when something happens, if you read the book we wrote or or you're in a community group and you're going to answer the question, there's this imputed righteousness of God that will be in your community groups as you read through that together that has a place in this. 
But here's three quick things I want to tell you about our world. One is this, in our broken world, everybody has enemies. So don't really sit there like this, don't apply to me. Now, our enemies, Ephesians 6, teaches us this, but it originates in heaven. But as I wrote in the notes, uh, Jesus said to his disciples, some of you, your enemies may be even in your own home. Secondly, in a broken world, there'll be opportunities to get even with your enemies. You see that coming on the screen. You, 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 at this point right here, you're not, you're not really paying attention. But there, there is an enemy that you have that knows this, that if he can orchestrate for you an opportunity, we'd use the word revenge or get even or get ahead, Dennis. We, you and I, before we grew up, I don't want to get even with somebody. I want to get ahead of them. That, that there will be an opportunity. I, I want to tell you this. If you may need not right now, but there's, there will be a moment. There will be a moment where where you will have the opportunity. But here's the third thing is where I hang my hat today. Number three is this. In a broken world, only Christians can overcome our enemies. You need to understand this. A lost and dying world may talk about it. They'll, they'll use questions like this. Well, I'll forgive, but I can't forget. Or they'll use terminology like this. It's impossible to do. You just can't do it. Do you know the Bible says in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8 that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil? Do you know in Luke 19, Jesus was weeping and praying because he was the source and their, of their victory, but they chose not to do that? I want to tell you today that David's story could, listen to this, curl your toes if you really read the depths of it. Because the truth is that for 10 years, his mom and dad had to live away from their home just because of their connectivity to David. David could not go to the temple and worship. David couldn't be around his family and friends, the people he grew up with. For 10 years, he was an innocent man on the run. Can you imagine every day getting up and Facebook is dogging you? Could you imagine getting up every day and TikTok and everything? Everywhere that you go that you, you just never knew if you, if you were going to get out, I think that could sour you. People that can't go, go home to a family reunion because something somebody else has done or, or you can't visit this city or you can't go to this work or, or it's just a vision. There's just so much tied around this that some of us can't be effective with our families because we cannot, this hard thing is going on in our lives. And this was David in his life. Now, let me kind of just tell you this. David was growing in the midst of his pressure and you need pressure so that you can grow. Alexander McLaren, one of the, the great early spiritual church fathers, said this about suffering. He said, every person has what they call hindrances or hard times to live with. But remember this, he said, hindrances are helped. There'd be no summer unless there was a winter had gone before it. There, there would be no bud or a fruit for, or for every snowflake. Excuse me, say that again. There is a bud or a fruit for every snowflake and a bird song for every howl of the storm. So you have to go through some things before you appreciate some things. And so in this broken world that we live in, you're going to have to go through some things. And so David is going through some things. So look with me in your Bible, Psalm, excuse me, 1 Samuel 24 and 1. When Saul returned from following the Philistines, he was told, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Now, remember, Saul had been pulled away because the, the Philistines had come, and so David had escaped. He's gone to En Gedi. If you know anything about En Gedi, I've been there. It is this wonderful o oasis in the wilderness, or, or what we would say in the desert. It has rivers. It, it has streams. It has waterfalls. There's vegetation. It's, it's just kind of, it's just it's a wonderful place, and David had escaped there. And the truth is, you and I would love to escape from the pressures, wouldn't we? He goes there like, God, if you just let me here for a little while. But the scripture says, in the midst of all that, Saul hears where he is. And the scripture says this, then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all of Israel. Now notice this. And he went to seek David and his men in front of the wild goats. Now think about this. Here he comes. Now, what did I say earlier to you a moment ago? And I, just, I want to review. It's in your notes. And so, brother, you're going to leave the slide there for quite a while where we are on this one. But I'm going to go back and review. Remember we said in a broken world, everybody has enemies. It's not always been that way. When, when Adam and Eve were created by God, they were not against each other. They were for each other. And only when the enemy, Satan, entered into the picture did it change in their lives. But you know and I know you've never lived a day, and I've never lived a day without brokenness and darkness in this world. You say, how did David get through? Here's how. David was not focused on Saul. He was focused on the Savior. If you focus on the people and the problems that you are going through, you will never, ever overcome. And I just want to tell you, I, I, I kind of let, let the end out now for you in the message and tell you this. It's not within you to do what David did on your own. 
So you, you can, today you can just stop believing that whatever that, that's being said, that I've got to make myself, that I've got to draw from my inner old nature self to be able to pull it out and do it. You can't do it. It's not the DNA of who you are apart from Christ, but in Christ he will impute Titus 3 and 5, his righteousness inside of you. So that's when Paul said it is no longer I but Christ. You see, now you have this ability to be able to do what you could not do because it will not be you doing it. All you got to do is surrender and let Christ stir up his power because you will focus on a righteous life. So here David is in this moment. See, the Bible says 2 Timothy 2 and 4 that no one who's engaged in warfare shall entangle himself in, in the pursuits of men. But as a soldier, he or she will want to please the one who, listen to this, recruited them. You see, if David was listening to himself, then David will be like the world would say, revenge, get even, stay away from. Now, some of you right now, it may not be bother you. I, I paid a bit of attention to this, and, that, and then listen to me. I, I, I get it. I was at a certain age. I didn't have any of those issues. But if you ever get an enemy that gets, it gets beyond the peripheral and hurts you, and you don't get rid of it right then in righteousness, let me tell you, it becomes a battleground. So here was David, and the scripture teaches us in verse 3, notice this, and he came to the sheepfolds by the way where there was a cave, and Saul went in to relieve himself. Now, you can't make this stuff up. And so he goes, and scripture says, now David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave. Now, this is another, remember the caves were large. I've been there, they're massive. I don't know if all 600 of his warriors are with him or if it's just a few of them. But David's in the recesses hiding in this cave and Saul comes in and please don't get mad. It's what the scripture says. I mean, he's caught with his pants down. Remember what I said to you early in the message? In a broken world, there'll be opportunities to get even. Now, you're, maybe as of right now, you're, you're, you're not there with me, but the scripture says here, now David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave, and the men of David said to him, you know what the Bible says. They didn't say that. They, they didn't say that. Have you ever been in a conversation with someone who came to you, and in the moment you just identified with them? You're like, hey, I know exactly what you're going through. I know how you feel. I, I hear this too often. And the scripture says, they said this, here is the day which the Lord said to you. You know what they're playing? Here's the card, Jared, they're playing. They're playing it's God's will card. I imagine when we get to heaven that we're going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ longer than we think. Because there's going to be a lot of this, that was not my will, 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 that was not my will. You in that moment were casting a shadow over me because you said that was my will whenever you could. And the truth is you couldn't find it anywhere in the Bible. God had never said to David that he was to kill Saul. He'd actually said the opposite. They said, here's the day which the Lord said to you, behold, I will give your enemy into your hand and you shall do to him as it seems good to you to do. In other words, David, it's time, brother. We've run far enough. Can I challenge you today to be careful who you listen to? Because everybody that you listen to has also been through what you've been through or about to go through you've been through. And, and you need to know, first of all, before you hear from them, how they actually went through it. How did they respond? If someone says, Keith, I know exactly how you feel, I'll usually pause and say, okay, tell me what you went through. Not in a disrespecting way because, I, Jimmy, I want to learn. I want to learn if, if they're biblical in that and if it can bypass me. I learned early on at University of Kentucky and, and church history and all the history classes I used to take that this, if I can learn from somebody's mistake, I don't have to make it. If I can learn from something they did that was right in the sight of God, then, then I can bypass my own mistakes. And so there they were in this moment. And listen, I know what some of you are hearing. You're hearing that I need to get even. Retribution never, ever gives you what you think that you want. It, all it does is this. It increases the rot. It makes you have more things to deal with in your life relationship. There's only one way, and it's been on the screen for quite a while now, in your broken world, only Christians can overcome. And so there David was in that moment, as we said earlier, David understood, but he also understood 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13, that the devil is a liar and a deceiver. But you're saying, but, but Keith, you don't know what's happened to me. I, I, I don't. I really don't. I only know what little few little things in my own life. 
But I've counseled enough through 31 years of ministry, uh, pastors and leaders and business people uh, and people in the common life of, of, of everything. And I found this to be that there's some things that are consistent with all of us. And that is we're all human and we all hurt. But there's a difference in how we handle things. And so here David is, and listen to me, David in this moment realized something. Two wrongs do not make a right. It goes even farther today in our society. I see it uh, so often in reading and, 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 and honestly in meeting people uh, that, for example, uh, the, a girl dating a guy and he mistreats her. He just, he just abuses her. And it's wrong and it's sinful and it's terrible. So, so she decides that because of this guy that did what he did, that, that, that it must not be good for a, a girl to date a guy. So she decides, I'm going to date a girl because a girl would not do another girl that way. Two wrongs do not make a right. David, in this moment, is being challenged. And look what the Scripture says. Then David arose and stealthily cut off the corner of Saul's robe. I have my, my trusty handkerchief. It dates me, correct? This is actually a newer one. But I just grew up with handkerchiefs, and I keep one with me at all times. They're still shivery, still alive in our world today. So David, this long robe, he goes over, and I don't, at this day, I don't know exactly why that he did it, Brother Danny, other the fact that maybe he's going to testify, hey, I could have killed you. But he cuts off the robe, which was wrong. Have you ever, as a Christian, tried to get even without God knowing it? You're like, now, you, now you're meddling, preacher. I just let me meddle for a moment. Can I please? I mean, you came anyway. We've locked the doors. You got to stay. <laughs> no. A slight jab cut in the rope. A little bit of slander when you're talking to somebody else out of your hurt. They ask you a question about the person and you just slander them in the moment. I've done it. That how, and just in the moment that you, you, you didn't answer the phone when they called. You steered away from it. You, you, when you're called to bless, you, you cursed. You see, all of us have those moments like David. When we cut the corner of the robe, or we actually do this, my brothers and sisters, we cut corners with God. I don't say this out of meanness or wanting to condemn. I, I want you to be liberated today. Verse number five says this, and afterward David's heart was struck him because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. You know why his heart struck him? Because David was filled with the Spirit of God. You see, uh, uh, this, this is so true. Chuck Swindoll in his commentary said this, when you walk close with God, you desire every detail of your life to be in order with God. That's why James 3 is so, so vividly true in, it, in his first 11 verses when he says that if anybody can control the tongue, he or she is a mature person. And, and listen, our tongues are set on fire by hell. And the truth is that at best we're inconsistent in our flesh, in our tongue. He said, because out of the same tongue will come blessing and cursings, and these things should not be. And so I'm going to tell you today, it's only in Christ can you overcome this. And here David was in that moment. He was God's anointed. And no matter how unfair Saul had treated him, David realized it was not his business to be in the judgmental business. Somehow in our humanity, from the very beginning, that when Satan tempted Eve and said, has God really said that Eve was taking the place of judge now and saying, God, you're wrong. I need to eat this because you're withholding from me. And from that moment on, don't we say, God, you just don't work fast enough? God, I, you say, I'd never say that to God. We do when we cut off the corner. Listen to me. God's wheel of justice grinds slow, but it grinds fine. My job, here's one of the ways that the imputed righteousness of Christ has helped me in my life with, for, with forgiveness. Here's the deal. Forgiveness is with the Lord. My job is not to get caught up in unforgiveness. Now you say, preacher, are you saying that you should let somebody slap you in the face every day? Absolutely not. If you're being sexually abused, get away now. If you're being mentally abused, get out of it as quickly as you can. I'm not saying divorce if you're in a situation. I'm saying move out until things get better in your life. Seek the counsel of Christian people because God does not intend for you to live that way. I can show you that directly from the Word of God. But for many of us, it is the little things 
that we have allowed build up. And that's why that there will be that person in that moment in time who they are probably mostly innocent. You will unload on them. And as a Christian, I believe this, that the imputed righteousness of God will push out those things if you'll handle it in the right way. Now, David said to his men in verse 6, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord. The Lord's anointed to put out my hand against him, seeing he's the Lord's anointed. So David persuaded his men with these words and did not permit them to attack Saul. It's just like a mother saying to her children, No, 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 you don't have to defend me in this moment. God's in charge. So I don't know who this is for today, but I know this, that David is an example for us. Saul rose up and left the cave and went on his way. Verse 8, afterward, David also arose and, and he went out of the cave and called after Saul, my Lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed his face to the earth and paid homage. David said to Saul, why do you listen to the words of men who say, behold, David seeks your harm? Now watch this. The enemy was working in Saul. Behold, this day your, your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you today into my hand in the cave. And some told me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not put out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Now, here is our first core value of the church, that we value knowing and applying God's word. So when you get in that moment, the righteousness of God says this, God, what do you say about this? If you could just pause in every circumstance, God, what do you say about this? It would change everything. The Bible says here, notice in verse 11, see my father, see the corner of your robe in my hand, for by the fact that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you, you may know and see that there is no wrong or treason in my hand. See, my problem was this, that many times when my dad spanked me, yes, it was too hard, but part of the reason that he spanked me was my unrighteousness. Anybody getting me? Some of you in this room have, have a clouded view. You can give as good as you can get. The truth is you give as good as you get. And because of that, you're just looking on your own side of that dynamic. There's, if there's total unrighteousness in the room, there's no way that a righteousness, unless it invades the room, can get in the room. You've got to be the one, if you're a Christian, someone else not, to bring the righteousness in the room. It's imputed to you by Christ. And so this was David. The Bible says here in verse 12, may the Lord judge between me and you. May the Lord avenge me against you. May my hand not be against you. As the proverb of the ancients says, out of the wicked comes wickedness. Wow. But my hand shall not be against you. After whom has the king of Israel come out? After who do you pursue? After a dead dog? Same words that, that Goliath had used. A flea. May the Lord therefore be judged. The same thing that Sarah had said to Abraham. May there God, Lord, judge between you and give sentence between me and you and see to it and plead my cause and deliver me from your hand. What a moment. Remember now, in our broken world, only Christians can overcome. Now, what's with the scripture? As soon as David had finished speaking these words to Saul, Saul said, is this your voice, my son, David? He was shocked. And Saul lifted up his voice and he, listen to this, this demented man wept. Never thought you would see it. He said to David, you are more righteous than I, for you have repaid me with good, whereas I repaid you with evil. So where in the world do you get this from, David? He gets it for, from God himself that imputed that inside of him. I'm telling you, when Christ comes to live inside of you and you're in the word of God, you're in prayer, you're in worship before God, when you are in your family living the right way, when you're in service and mission to God, when you're being filled with the spirit of God, things will rush into you like, where did that come from? Because before, listen, buddy, I heard a guy say several years ago, he was in a situation with someone and he said to him, he said, I want to tell you this, if I wasn't a Christian the way I used to be, I'd knocked you out already. That wasn't a good way to put it, but in the moment, it illustrated the point. And the guy, guy kind of puffed up. He said, but now I'll tell you something, man. I love you today. See the difference that Christ makes. The scripture says here that, that Saul says, I, you have declared in verse 18 this day how you've dealt well with me and that you did not kill me when the Lord put me into your hands. For if a man finds his enemy, will he let him go away safe? So may the Lord reward you with good for what you have done to me this day. And now behold, I know that you shall be surely king and the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hands. What retribution do you really want, my friend? Do you want retribution or redemption? Retribution is that you get even and they feel the pain that you feel. 
Redemption is this, that they get right with God and Rick, they feel the joy that you feel in Christ. You see, I too, I don't know about you, but I too needed to be forgiven. Anyone else? I too needed the, the righteousness imputed to my life of Jesus Christ. And so I today, I feel the joy and the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as long as I keep that in my mind, I'm able to do the right thing. You may have the time to do it in your, your Bible. You may not. I, I turn over to Romans chapter 12 and, and verse 9. I, I'm going to begin reading. You can catch up as you turn there. The Bible says, let love be genuine. Chapter 9, verse 9, hate what is evil and hold fast to what is good. We're going to move forward in the outline a little bit too as you're there. You say, Keith, how in the world can, can I do what David did in that moment? Well, first of all, you've got to come into a personal relationship with Jesus. We've already talked about the righteousness of God. I'll come back there. But if you don't know Jesus Christ, you can try these principles and they work for a little while. But the devil is so powerful, there'll be a moment that, that you will go right back to where you were. Verse 10 says, love one another with a brotherly love. Outdo one another in showing honor. Now watch this. Don't be slothful in zeal. For us, that means this. Don't live apart from the Bible. Just don't do it. Now watch this. Be fervent in the spirit. In other words, God, what do you say? So I, I look at this on the screen. Okay? Not to come into personal relationship, but commit your life to knowing and applying God's word in your life. As you do that, you're able to do what God's word says. Serve the Lord. Verse 12, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Verse 14, oh, this is good. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not Curse them. Here it is. Number three, commit yourself to removing the ways of the flesh. How do I bless those? This is how I bless somebody is that I just don't talk about what they've done. And I want to tell you today that if you're plotting your revenge now, you are wrong. Bless those who persecute you. Verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice. Verse 16, live in harmony with one another. Now think about this. You say, how do I do that? Well, don't be haughty. Don't asso do associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is, oh, honorable in the sight of God. God, you're, you're, you're watching this. this. Now watch this. This is your child. You say, wait a minute, they're not a Christian. No, 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 no. That's true, but they were created in the image of God. So they are his creation. So God, this is your creation. That's why it's different between us and the animals. And so I want to encourage you, follow the guidance. Here's the last point. Follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will lead you to repay no one for evil for evil and to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, verse 18 says, as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. They may not depend upon you. They may not let you be peaceable. Find you a place where that you can be peaceable. Never avenge yourself. Leave it to the wrath of God. David did that in that moment. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. I, here's how I know when I'm really living in the imputed righteousness of God. I don't want him to give them what they deserve. That's why after I got saved, my first prayers were for my dad to get saved. And within less than a year, he did. See, right now, how your life could be different if you just do these things. He says, actually, the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you'll heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, here it is. You said in the very beginning, you wrote down, I'm currently having a hard time with, did you not? Now, here's what I'd ask you to do. Come before God and say, God, I'm handing over to you what is hard for me. I'm handing to you what is hard for me. I promise you in this moment, in your hands, it can't happen. But in God's hands, it has to happen because he's God. Thank you for joining us for the Awaken Life series. For more information about this series or to receive the companion book, you can reach out to us at info at jacksonfbc.com. 
May God richly bless you as you live the awakened life.